Greetings, my scattered brothers and sisters in the Lord. Trust you know the Lord is with you wherever you find yourself scattered today, and that you know that his presence with you is more than enough for whatever you might face today. Well, we are wrapping up Mark chapter 8, and we've been here for a little while. Jesus has been having a pretty intense conversation with his disciples. He has asked them, who do you say that I am? And for the first time, Peter gets it right. You are the Christ. Now, when Peter says this, he has all kinds of expectations in his mind. Uh, he believes that Jesus is the Messiah and that as the Messiah, the king, that Jesus is going to establish his rule and that they're going to overthrow all other opposing rules, whether that's Rome, whether that's the corrupt Jewish leadership, but that Jesus is going to establish his rule, establish the throne of David, and likely through military force of some sort, through power of some sort, through inflicting defeat on others. And Jesus begins to teach Peter and all of them about how he's going to bring God's kingdom. And it's nothing like they expect. He says that he is going to go to Jerusalem. Well, they expected that, but that he was going to be handed over and that he was going to be, uh, he's going to suffer and that he was going to be executed, put to death. And then three days later, rise. They had no idea that was beyond their wildest expectation. And in fact, it's so out of the box, so upside down, that Peter began to rebuke Jesus. Like, <laughs> Jesus, it's not going to happen that way. You're the Messiah. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, you're not looking at this from God's perspective. You're thinking about this from a human perspective. And then Jesus went on to not only teach about his cross, but the cross of discipleship and said that any one is going to come after me and kind of be part of my movement, part of this kingdom project, part of God's kingdom come, then they're going to have to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after him, that they're going to have to surrender to Jesus and surrender to the cross. And Jesus goes on as he teaches, and he says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? If any of you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." And so Jesus is talking about how if you're trying to save your life to be part of this world, you're actually going to lose it. And But the one who gives up everything now will actually have a share in God's kingdom. And Jesus speaks of how he'll return and that if we're ashamed of him now, he'll be ashamed of us then. But if we honor him now through this sacrifice of all, he will honor us then. We'll be part of the kingdom. And then it kind of moves in. Jesus keeps speaking, and we move into chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, that's what I want us to focus on today, where Jesus is telling them, there are some of you who are standing here right now, and you won't taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Power. Uh, there's a couple of ways that this is understood. Uh, some read this verse as part of the story that follows in chapter 9, where Peter, James, and John are going to be taken uh, by Jesus to this mountain, and Jesus is going to be transfigured before them, and he's going to glow, and they're going to see Jesus in all of his glory, and Moses and Elijah are going to show up, and they're going to hear from God. And so some read verse 1 as really part of the rest of chapter 9, that it's Peter, James, and John who won't taste death before they see the kingdom come in power, and they see Jesus glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. So that's one way it's understood, but I really don't think that's the best way to understand it. See, when Jesus is saying that they're going to see the kingdom of God come with power, uh, I think that Jesus is still talking about his cross, that that's how the kingdom of God is going to come, and they're going to be witnesses of Jesus going to the cross. 
And when Jesus goes to the cross, that's when God's kingdom comes. And for example, Jesus is dying on the cross in chapter 15, and he breathes his last, he cries out, he's dead. And the Roman centurion, who is overseeing his execution, when he sees how Jesus has died, the Roman centurion says, surely this was the Son of God. And so when Jesus is there dying, the Roman centurion, who would one recognize death, but who also recognizes power and kingdoms, he recognizes that Jesus was the Son of God, the one who brings God's kingdom. And it's at that moment that the temple and the or the curtain in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. It's like God is breaking forth his kingdom coming. And so the kingdom comes, God's rule breaks evil through Jesus going to the cross. And with the resurrection, even death is defeated. And so just kind of thinking about that, that that's how God's kingdom comes, is through Jesus going to the cross. And then how do we participate in the coming of God's kingdom? Again, Jesus says, if anyone's going to come after me, be part of God's kingdom come, need to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And I think that that's when I see kind of the glory of God's kingdom. That's when I see God's kingdom coming, is when I see someone really denying themselves and being all in for Christ, no matter what the consequences. And it may not look like much from kind of a worldly perspective. It may even look like foolishness, Jesus going to the cross. Um, but whenever I see someone who is all in for Christ, no matter what the cost, it's kind of like afresh, I see the glory of God's kingdom breaking in. And it's fresh assurance that, yeah, God's way is the victorious way. God's future is the future that will prevail rather than the world as it is or rather than living for self. And whenever I practice that of kind of being all in, it's like, yeah, this is God's king. God is ruling. God's ruling me and God's ruling through me and I'm surrendered. And as I'm surrendered, I get to kind of experience the glory of God's kingdom coming in. And so wherever you find yourself scattered today, you know, my prayer is that you'll be able to behold, you know, the glory of God's kingdom breaking in. Yes, behold it in terms of Jesus going to the cross and thinking about that, but also behold it as you look around you and you see brothers and sisters who are sold out for Christ no matter the cost. And I also pray that you'll be able to behold it as you look in the mirror and as you surrender to Christ Jesus and his lordship, and you'll experience the glory of God's kingdom breaking in, in your life and through your life. God bless. Have a great day. May we see his kingdom come.